we've begun to talk about Carl and his big presence in this in this memoir. And and one of the things that really struck me was thinking about again, as I'm always doing as a literature professor, thinking about your book in conversation with uh, other Black women's writing. And I was thinking about the ways that in Black women's writing, like capaciously from, you know, the Caribbean writers such as, you know, Jamaica Kincaid and Maurice Gondé to, you know, African writers so much, such as Amata Adu and Ndozake Shange to, oh, I'm sorry, to Ndozake Shange to Titi Dumbarenga in Zimbabwe, you know. The, the, yeah, I love nervous conditions. Yeah, it's like this full beautiful set of, a canon, a canon, a set of texts. Um, that in that body of work, mother-daughter relationships are so central, right? They're so, they are such a sacred site for exploration of a self, oftentimes a young protagonist, but not always, right? Sometimes the mother figure writing as she's thinking about her daughters. And you do that so powerfully in The Yellow House. Your grandmother and mother loom large in this text. Um, and we feel a certain sense of intimacy with them as characters. But one of the things that I think that's so unique and so profound and what you contribute so especially is this relationship between siblings particularly mm. sister brother relationships right mm. I, I felt so i felt so close to carl and michael and daryl like i they felt so familiar to me and i i fell in love with them through mm -hmm. you right mm. and i and i missed them after the book was over and i and i wanted to hear from you like was that something that you that you thought about and with, with, with a form of intention or is that something that just kind of came organically as you were as you were writing i mean there's this startling moment where you as protagonist narrator asks a brother you know what's the difference between a brother and a father right um and i and i think that that moment sort of really crystallized these it crystallizes the importance of brother figures in this work so i just wanted to just you know it's a it's a it's a small and yet such a important detail of of the yellow house you know, if, if a book is an architectural place and it has beams and all these structures, I, I imagine my brothers as the sort of, if we just strip the walls bare, you know, they're the, the, the sort of beams that actually hold the house up mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in some literal and also metaphorical way, because I think that they embodied a central absence that I was interested in pursuing in the book, which is the absence of my father. And my brothers are representational in the sense that they stand in for this absence, but then so that they become very connected to the yellow house, just as my father was, as the person who built a lot, a lot of it and and where he sort of resided for me in memory. And, and I also just had not seen, a, I hadn't seen many types of stories. One of them was a, a coming age story of a black girl who was on the periphery of a city and sort of, you know, couldn't see and, and was, you know, and, and, and this was nonfiction. I hadn't seen that. And I hadn't seen somebody surrounded by all of their siblings in all of the myriad interesting ways that the, those other humans impacted the, the person. And, and I, I write about the ways in which my siblings tell me the, the history of who I am. Hmm. Right. And, and so to, to sort of let them <clears throat> show up on the page and to sort of sound like their, their own selves and have rhythms. And, you know, that moment you talk about, I'm glad you mentioned the moment where I say, what's the difference between a father and a brother? Because that's actually a very important moment for me in the book, yeah. because it's the moment where I think my brother understands who I am and, but can't tell me the history of who I am. Yeah. And so something is fissured in a way between us because there, there's a reality of mine. And that is the writerly point of view, right? The writerly point of view is singular. Yeah. And, and my writerly point of view can never be my brother's 
point of view. Um, so on that level, the book is also making a commentary, I think, about mm -hmm. the limitations of another person well, telling you who you are. Who you are, yeah. I mean, one thing that I love so much about, you know, the, the conversations that you had, you know, with your brothers as they're, as they're written in the Yellow House is the, is the humor. I was surprised, I found myself laughing, I was getting laughed, cutting up, straight up, cutting up, like laughing out loud, you know, in between all of the sadness in the morning and the yeah. dick and the, you know, um, the devastating narrative um, in so many ways. There was so much humor and creativity around language and the black vernacular. And like, I mean, I just, I, one of the first places I was just cracking up and couldn't barely stop was like the tape recorder. She's like, yeah, now oh, they're yeah. calling me tape recorder. Like there were so many great instances of nicknames and disses Right, and I just, I just wanted to, to celebrate that with you. It was, it was something that um, I guess I didn't, I, I didn't expect it. Again, the way oftentimes we encounter a book is often, you know, after we've heard reviews and from friends or right. what we've heard, and your book has been almost notorious, you know, this this year and this last year um, since its publication. So that that there would be so much laughter um, that would come from me as a reader, but also laughter in the text was was really just wonderful and i really just yeah that. i love it i love it so much uh i know we're probably running out of time um as far as my questions i could i could i have so many more questions um i'm gonna pose one more before i open it up um for questions from our many um participants you talked already a lot about absences and how you were stirred so much about um the question about what was missing um, as you were writing this book or as you were even in the process of writing. And, I, and I'm so grateful for how the book is also very much like a Kunzo Roman, right? The story of a writer, someone coming into voice. And there's so much to say about that. But my question is around the, the sort of big questions and conversations and debates about the archive that we are presently, I would say, in Black studies very preoccupied by, particularly, you know, in, in disciplines such as, you know, cultural studies and literature and history, of course. We talked about the ways that Toni Morrison talks about memory and loss in her work. Um, and of course, I know that you're speaking to Saidi Hartman in a couple of weeks, and I look forward to, to hearing um, that conversation as she speaks a lot about the archive as a site of lack, right? As right. what the limits of the archive. And this and this memoir really takes up that question very self-consciously, right? And one ways you really trace for us how black lives in New Orleans and New Orleans East very specifically exceed the archive, that there are no records of these lives, right? And that's part of the purpose, I think, of the memoir. But at the same time, the memoir is very reliance on the archive, right? There are photographs. We read you doing research, right? You, you, you're citing up scholars and newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to ask you, now that the book is out there and has a life of its own, you know, has that changed your thinking of the archive? Or, and or, you know, as you, I imagine, begin to think about your next work, like is the archive still something that you are, are kind of wrestling with mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, your, in the larger sort of imaginary from which your work emerges from? I think so. I think I'm wrestling with the archive in the similar way as the map, in fact. Understanding that the map is, it's very complicated that we can turn it spherically and understand the ways in which it's useful, understand the ways in which it's not useful, understand how we can be exploitative of it mm -hmm. and use it for our own purposes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the archive is so intriguing because I think for most of my life as a curious person, I, I'm, I think I'm innately curious. You know how people complain about their children saying, <laughs> but why? But why? I'm still that person. I'm still that person. Okay. And, and I just want to know, I want to ask many questions and always be driven by them. And what I, I think I had an over-reliance on evidence, the importance of evidence. I could only believe something I felt in my younger years. If, if I could find the evidence for it, it wasn't true unless I could find the paper. And I think my mother, Ivory May is partly responsible for this because my mother saves paper, believes in evidence, and she's doing it because you will need to know one day, yeah. right? 
And, but, but I think in working on this book, I realized, no, but, but what about the world of things that aren't recorded because they're not deemed valuable? Right. And so they're just not in the record. I think what's so interesting about the use of the archive in this book, and I think it's going to change in my, in my later work, is that I was able to juxtapose the two and say, okay, so if it takes me 30 seconds to find the history going back to 1690 of my French Quarter apartment, and it takes me 10 years right. to find the poultry history, I think that's what Hartman is doing, right? Is saying, okay, so now we're going to find the ways to fill in that gap because I don't have yeah. 15, 20 years, right? To figure right. this out. Right. If I can even ever right. get to <laughs> figuring it out. So I think this, this distrust built in me about the archive. And I, and I started to think about oral history and how to use oral history, for instance, in the work to stand in for something, mm -hmm. how to um, use maps and papers and all of these things to highlight what actually I couldn't find about New Orleans East, which was my driving subject, yeah. right? And I think all of the presence of the archive for these other things highlight it for me. But I love the search. I will never give it up <laughs> because it's the discovery of the small piece of paper that's in somebody's file folder that no one ever looks at that that really makes me feel that that it's the discovery the the intention the wanting to know you know um that also matters yeah yeah there's that really poignant place in the narrative where you thought that you have found this film um that records your father performing you know in a second line and you're convinced that it's him and you know it makes sense that it's him he's got all the signs the hat the instrument the tall person um and you know you find out that it's not him but there's this moment before you talk to your mom to confirm that you're like this is what this project has been all about i found him can you just say a little bit more about that moment because it's such a it's such an interesting moment because of course the memoir continues for, right. <laughs> it's, it's like there's a way that, you know, as a reader, you're like, okay, but this isn't at all what this is all about. It's about so much more. But at that moment of your research and discovery, there's a sense of satisfaction. And then, of course, within a couple of days and discovery and placement and, and like sort of like, okay, evidence, I'm firm, I understand something about myself. And then, of course, it all kind of comes asunder. Well, I think I'm really intrigued by the nature of loss about traces in particular, the traces of loss on our body, mm. the ways in which loss maps itself within the body. Um, it can lead you to do all sorts of crazy things. <laughs> and it's magical and it's magical thinking. And so for me, uh, uh, one of 12 children, the only one who didn't know this father of ours, who is, is mythic in the family. You know, this is a very, I grew up and was born into a very matriarchal world where the women really didn't hold up men very much. They were sort of like, it's me, yeah. hello. That's right. <laughs> That's how it went, right? <laughs> and the men were secondary to their narrative. But in my, with my mother, you know, she really adored my father. She found him intriguing. And he, so he had a very mythical sort of position in the family. And so for me to feel, it's the one moment in the book where I actually feel that I allowed myself to be very emotional because it's personal now. Yeah. And here I am in the archive, sneak recording this video just wanting to be able to carry this myth in my tote bag. Right. Because what is writing except for the constant dissolving 
of these huge subjects and ideas that we're just winnowing down, trying to break down. We're talking about family and home and place and belonging, right? The goal is to get it to be small enough that you can carry it in your tote bag. You it in a book, right? In, in and so word. now I can resolve a central absence of my life and have it in my tote bag. It's an intellectual enterprise. Mm. And so, and that's why I think I leave it there for so long, you mm. know? Uh, and, uh, you know, yes, it's unresolved, actually. Thank you. You give me so much to think about. I feel like this is a whole other book. <laughs> I'm taking notes. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, bring in some other voices into our conversation. And um, we have a question. Um, I don't have the name of the person closing it, but it is um, a question that asks, I offer you a question given to my 13-year-old son as part of his social studies homework. What is the purpose of culture? And what is the purpose of culture in New Orleans? So we're just Ooh. giving you all these questions. This is a great question. It's a great question for a 13 year old. I have a 12 year old. Maybe I'll question. question. Yeah. What is the purpose the of culture purpose in New Orleans? Culture in New Orleans. Whoa. I mean, I feel like <laughs> I don't even know, right? Like that is, I could actually go write a big book about that. Yeah. What is the purpose of culture and what, you know, it's interesting. Okay, here's how I can approach it. And I want to say, and this is useful also for the 13 year old because me who has many 13 year old nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. I say all the time, I don't know. <laughs> and so I'm giving you a fragment of a way of, of approaching it. You know, there was a moment, um, after George Floyd, where, where, for instance, we saw people uh, going around buying every racism, every book that had the word racism or anti-race in, in the title. And I was so sort of interested in that moment because I thought about what art does. So when I think of culture, I think instantly of art. Um, and the cultural workers, you know, who, who allow us to grasp onto something when we're feeling most despairing, who give us an opportunity at ritual. In New Orleans, I instantly think ritual. Yes. That, that when I'm away from home, New Orleans, I miss all the rituals of my life. And I think the answer is, has something to do with all of those things, which is that in the moment when we want to learn, we actually don't want to read the book with the word racism in the title. We maybe want to read about flowers or home or the way the light hits mm -hmm. or somebody on a journey, right? Um, we want to come to know and, and I think culture gives us those opportunities, those glimpses, those moments. Um, Jasmine Ward, speaking of culture, hmm. has a piece in Vanity Fair online, which everyone watching should go read immediately. And it's called Witness and Respair. The word respair, R E S. P-A-I-R, like despair, but with an R. And this idea of despair, that if you are in a pit of despair, the hope coming out of it is despair, witness and despair, mm -hmm. and how that's becoming a cultural moment because she's giving us something so textural and poignant to hold on to and she's making us feel and how difficult is it to make someone feel something mm -hmm. right 
Um, so all of that is part of my answer, which is an unintelligible answer. No, but no, it's so rich. Thank you so much. I mean, that's a difficult and huge question. As you said, there's many, many books and many, many lifetimes of knowledge to, to try to, uh, uh, you know, to mine, to, to respond to this question. Um, I have one more question um, from Brad and Colleen uh, Beers. And they want to know if the book took you on a journey you expected, or if in writing you went somewhere unexpected. Ooh, yeah. what was the I journey love that like? Question. That's a wonderful question. You know, I don't think any journey can ever a true one can take you where you think you might <laughs> be going. But that is actually the hardest part of taking a journey. Um, when I was a little baby, I spent some time in Southeast Asia. I was working for Time Magazine and I was the person who went out and collected string. They called it string. And then I would bring it back and the men in glass offices would write the story based on the string I collected. And once they sent me to Cambodia, and I knew no Khmer. I had never really, I didn't know anything. I don't even know how I survived it. But just getting on the back of a moto and going, you know, and just having so much fear, but it was already too late. So <laughs> I was on the back of the moto. Right. So now what? And the book felt like that in a way. It was sort of like, okay, I think I want to write a story about the dilapidated house I grew up in. It actually began that simply. But the work of discovering what kind of writer I was, how, how I wanted to use fragments and pieces and what it might look like to layer things, to lay a film over another film, over another film, like what would come up through the corners of something like that was really extremely scary, so scary, I almost don't want to remember it. Hmm. But but I think that that's the discovery, that's the doing something new, is, is feeling fear maybe after the fact. Wow. Because in the days of, before this book was coming out, I wasn't sleeping, I was dreaming of my family disowning me and you know, all of these terrible, you know, I had all these fantasies. They were disaster fantasies. And, um, but that's where journeys take us, you know? And, and so I knew nothing about where this book would go, in fact. And in the revision, the things that I knew, I, I deleted. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. I know we are officially out of time. We have so many questions. We have questions upon questions. Um, but I am so grateful for your presence and how seriously and, and deeply, sincerely you've responded to our questions. And, and I know that you must be exhausted. You're on, a, you're on a fast train. You know, everyone wants to have a conversation with you, but I really am um, I'm so grateful um, for your, you. your full presence with us tonight. It's such thank a you. Thank you for the great questions. And before we go, I just want to say I love Tulane and always will because <laughs> uh, a student named Lisa Brown actually became my intern when I was living in New Orleans and, and doing all these interviews of my family, hundreds of hours. And she transcribed hundreds of hours. Wow of interviews and and so I have a soft spot in my heart for <laughs> Tulane students because Yay, of that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone who's on the call and thank you Newcomb College Reading Project for putting this together. I'm just so honored and so grateful and so thrilled um, to be here tonight and um, I want to sign off and um, and welcome you know the continued conversation right it's the beginning of the school year for us here at Tulane, and we will continue to have the conversation um, put forward, the very, very rich conversation put forward by this magnificent piece of work. I can't, I, I'm just in awe that this is your first book, but we'll t I'll talk about that later. I'll just be, ah! Thank you. <laughs> I Thank had you pressure so for those of us writing books. We're like, gosh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> right. Thank very you so much. Thank, Thank you so much.
I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Skinner and everyone. Thank you for all the folks who supported us technologically as we were um, putting this all together. Good night, everyone, and take Bye. care. Good night. Bye.